I like to make sessions as interactive as possible. I'm not standing here as an expert on, on whatever I'm talking about. I am just a coder. I am you know, nobody particularly special. So, um, but I, so I'm, I'm way open to someone saying, that's wrong, it should be this way, and I'll probably respond with, yeah, okay, you're probably right. Um, so in order to increase uh, participation, I like to reward uh, participation. I have two different rewards. I have a top, and I have a build-it-yourself balsa wood glider. <laughs> I'm from Portland. Both of these things are biodegradable, <laughs> so that's important. Yeah, okay, you can't uh, biodegrade the plastic wrapper. But uh, if you participate, you get your choice. We'll pass it back to you. I used to throw these things, but I found out people could get damaged. <laughs> uh, so we'll pass it back. Um, I want to talk about ConstExpert because I think ConstExpert is extremely <coughs> cool. Um, I, you know, when I first heard about it, I didn't know this stuff was afoot until fairly late in the C++ 11 development. And I heard about it and I said, oh my god, I've wanted to do stuff like that for years. So um, this is not a, an, an expert's view of ConstExpert. This is an in-the-trenches view of <coughs> ConstExpert. And what I might want to do with it if all three of my compilers actually supported it. And the advanced function works. Technology wins again. So we're going to talk about ConstExpert. Um, there are, I'm going to go through some different phases. Uh, ConstExpert was introduced in C++11 and, and changes significantly in C++14. We'll talk about both of those. Um, and then as a developer, not as a computer scientist, but as someone who actually wants to get his fingers dirty with this stuff. I'll talk about ways in which I can envision constex for being applied. And this is all code that I have run, compiles in Clang, does useful stuff. I just can't use it in my professional code base because uh, one of the compilers they have is uh, uh, Visual Studio. And so we have to wait for Visual Studio 2015 but we'll get there eventually. So let's get started with constexpr. So constexpr, we're really talking about a constant expression or something that can generate a constant expression. Uh, I don't know the, the real origin of why that particular set of, of uh, characters was used. Uh, constexpr seems a little odd. I think it was someone did some you know, hunting around through existing code bases and said, there's a word that nobody's using, let's use that. But I, I don't know that for a fact, that's just rumor. It's a nice rumor. Um, so to me, the cool thing about ConstExpr is you can evaluate expressions at compile time. It's like template metaprogramming because it's at compile time. It's a, it's a much more familiar C++ syntax. So when you're looking at it, you know, if you have ordinary programmers like me as your coworkers, then you've got folks who can walk in, look at this stuff, and say, yeah, I think I know what's going on. <coughs> Whereas with template metaprogramming, they're going to sit back on their heels. And, you know, I have a number of coworkers that I have worked with in the past, not my current team, but in the past, good solid C++ programmers who had never worked with templates, who had never developed their own templates. They'd use them, they'd use the STL plenty, but they'd never written their own templates. So to me, constexpr is, is a real win. Um, so it only produces constant values. Constexpr objects cannot change at runtime. <coughs> so to me, why is this interesting? There's no runtime cost. I spent years doing embedded development. And so something that, that I don't have to spend cycles on uh, I like that. So no execution time, minimal executable footprint. The other thing that I really like is you can find your errors at compiler link time. That's the real win. And the top part was what it drew, me, drew, it, drew me to it initially. But finding errors at compile time, 
particularly for an embedded system. That's invaluable. You have a question. You say minimal executable footprint. Does, do you end up with symbols in your um, executable? Well, so, ah, yes. Thank you. Uh, minimal executable footprint, what do I mean? Uh, some of that is up to your compiler. So what your compiler does is entirely up to your compiler. However, uh, it has the potential to leave out a bunch of the code. So as much as is computed at compile time, it doesn't need to include that code in the runtime image. If there's data that you're computing that is const expert, it will oftentimes need to leave that data behind so that it can be referred to at runtime. If at runtime that data is never used, then the compiler has the ability to say, look at that, <coughs> nobody's using it, let me leave it out, either the compiler or the linker. So, you know, this is, this is all potential stuff, but it's what the compiler is allowed to do. And so you have to kind of have to check on your compiler to see, is it doing what you want? Not that you can influence it, but you could at least learn what it's doing to you. Um, so one of the things that I'll bring up a little bit is if you compute something at compile time, there's no synchronization issue. People who have, and when we get to const expert containers toward the end, I've seen plenty of situations where someone has a container, they know everything they want at compile time, but because they want to put it in a, you know, a sorted order or they build structs with it or whatever, they're doing that at runtime. And now you have synchronization issues. If you can do that stuff at compile time, then everything you need is just sitting there. And you know, this is not a general solution. You can't, do all, you can't solve all problems that way, but you can improve your life. So we have a new keyword, const expert. It gets used in two different ways, two different kinds of situations. We'll see if this reaches. The keyword's introduced in C++ 11, and we have const expert values, which are you know, data, data things, objects. And that can be the definition of an object, a declaration of a static data member of a literal type, you also have const expert computations. So that's a way of annotating a computation to say, yeah, yeah, it's all right if you do this at compile time. And the way of annotating is cheap. You just throw the const expert keyword on the front. And if you've written your code right, then it just goes. So the easy part of this is the values. The, um, in C++11 and C++14, as far as I know, being just a coder, um, the value side of things did not change. So what I'm going to show you on this slide, it's the same in C++11, C++14. You don't have to make any adjustments. So what's cool here is that, see if, you know, for example, we have this const x for half which is 0 0.5, and I can do a static assert with that. Now, prior to this, compilers didn't really have compile time support for floats. So, and now I can start doing floating point computations and looking at the results of floating point computations at compile time. A static assert is something that, if it fails, your compiler gets in your face. Yes? The first line, uh, is there any difference between writing it like that and say con static const is? Nah. Yeah. Nah, so not similar. really. I think, I mean, I, uh, oh, repeat the question. Thank you. So the question was on the first line, is there any difference between writing that as const x per int or a static constant? And I think from, from a practical perspective, I think the answer is no. That you're, you're, there's no practical difference. And I'm falling behind on handing out rewards for people who are participating. Um, the first one, do you, do you prefer a top or a glider? I'll take a top. All right. Uh, so pass this back carefully. Don't want anybody to get hurt. And Boris, do you want a glider? I'll take a glider. A glider. <laughs> you looked like the glider kind, so could you pass that back? 
And I Thanks. have a question. Why do you need this static? Does it change the uh, linkage? Does Costa Expert change the linkage? Uh, so I, the static. only... Why did we need static? What about just oh. Costa? Oh, in the... Um, so the question is, why do we need this static? Like, what static? is the difference between const expert and const? We leave out the static. And I guess const would, would make it internal ah, linkage. Model, yeah, so, so anyway. right. So the so question. Why do we need the static? And depends on whether it's a namespace scope or function scope. Well, it's right. Well, let's say it's, it's a, a file scope there. Looks like it's a file scope there. <coughs> so. So my, so, the, so, 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 so the question is about what the statics are doing. I'm, at least the slide I'm looking at right now, the only statics are, I'm seeing are static asserts. No, no, I'm saying he asked the question, we replace const expert with static const int. Yes. Right? So my question is, why do we need the word static? What does that ah, do for okay. us? Okay, so the, so the question is, what does a static const int do versus... What does the static versus do for us? At at namespace scope. Right, because the, again, const expert, I don't know if that turns the linkage from external to internal or if that's even meaningful. So the question is, does the const expert turn this, the, the linkage from external to internal? Yes, that's, that's part of it. Okay, and, and I'm hoping that there's, ah, okay. Um, so thank you, I think, I think an answer is coming from the back, is that right? Okay. Does it change the linkage? Well, well let me, let me. Just like okay. So, it will be internal. okay. <coughs> so to, to summarize uh, Dr. Dosre's, uh, uh, Gabby, okay, thank you. Uh, l let me see if I can summarize this correctly. The, uh, the function, uh, the, the value that ConstExpert brings in this particular case is it requires that the evaluation happen at compile time that if it's just an int sitting out there and there's an interesting computation that is required, then without the const expert, that interesting computation will happen at runtime. The value you get out of that const expert is we're going to force it. It will not compile if it can't figure out what that value is at compile time. And, what, so. oh, and the one other point is the static doesn't add anything. There's no need for the static. Okay, and and thank you, Gabby. Uh, Gabby's nodding his head. The static that that Boris was asking about is not needed. Yes. Yes. That's what. I was okay. Right. <coughs> okay. Um, all right. So, and we're only three slides in. <laughs> so. Um, there are other situations where we can use const expr. We can use it at namespace scope. We can use it inside of a function. Um, we can also use it as a static data member of a literal type. Um, and uh, here's my acknowledgement of, of <laughs> the person who, uh, who brings us const expr. Thank you, Gabby. Um, so yeah, all of this stuff happening at compile time. Uh, and it's interesting to me. I can, I can create a, an array at compile time, and I can take the address of something at the array. And here in this static assert, you'll notice we're looking at the contents of that pointer. That's all happening at compile time. So the value rules, they may be any literal type. They can include floating point, character literals, pointer literals, literal objects, which are things constructed with const expert constructors. They don't require any storage declaration, which is actually kind of nice, because a lot of you know, static objects, you have to <coughs> make, stat make, make storage for them someplace. And here, the compiler will take care of that for you. And you cannot uh, pass const expert parameters. So that's not allowed. 
Yes. Why would you not allow that in the case where you have a function that's already const expert? So I'm not a committee member. <laughs> uh, so the question was, why would you not allow const, a const expert parameter in the case where you already have a const expert function? Yes. So, and my response is, uh, I'm not a committee member, so I can't tell you what their motivation was. Um, I think some of it is that, and, and we'll get to this later on, uh, const expert functions can be evaluated at compile time, but they don't have to be. And so if you introduce const expert uh, parameters, then you can start walking in the direction of const expert overloading. Marshall, who is a committee member. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> Membership on the committee it consists of those people who show up to meetings. Yeah, uh, okay. okay. Okay, yes. So there's, there's not really anything special about being a committee member except you're willing to put in the time and the work. Yes, okay. okay. Anyway, um, the comment you had about um, about uh, constructs or functions may or may not be actually be executed at compile time. Yes. There, except when the result is needed at compile time. So for example, if you have a constructs or function that returns an int <coughs> and yeah. you use you call that as the size of a built-in array, if you can't if it doesn't get run at, com at compile time, yeah. that's a that's a compile time error. So so I completely agree with everything Marshall said and I'm not going to repeat what he said because I'm hoping that when we get to my slides they'll say exactly what Marshall said. And then and then if I, if I didn't say what Marshall said, Marshall can correct me. Uh, okay, but I'm also getting behind and handing out rewards. Uh, uh, a glider. So, there's a question in the back. Yes? Well, so the reason that this doesn't work is because you can have a trailing return type, and now you can have your return type depend on the, um, the value of that. Or you can have another argument which the type of the argument is dependent on that. And that's not a normal function. You need, like, that's basically a template. Okay. Um, so I've just heard a great justification for why a const expert parameter is not allowed. I'm not sure I can repeat it, but I, I think we're, we're all good that the compiler will not allow you to do this. If the compiler sees this, the compiler w will complain. Gabby, please. Right. Now, once, now that we are all, we are all loving const expert, uh, adding const expert parameter brings the natural question, uh, are you going to overload on that? Right. One of the reasons why people want to have const expert parameter is that they say, oh, they have more efficient way of doing a compile time and different from doing a cross time. So that brings in this kind of uh, overloading or mm -hmm. not overloading, and most of the codes are already complicated. Yep. Right. So, so Gabby's point is, in, in terms of, of, of const expert parameters, he's saying that um, const expert is already complicated. And as soon as you allow const expert parameters, then that draws people toward overloading on <coughs> const expert. And it's complicated enough. Let's not necessarily make it more complicated. I think that's a great justification. Okay. So where can you use these things? Anywhere a literal can be used, which is, I think, what, well, OK. That may not be exactly what Marshall was saying, but that's true. Um, so you can use it where uh, in, in non-type template parameters, you can use it for array dimensions, uh, enum initialization, and also anywhere in your standard. And they're always implicitly const. Uh, and if you cast away const, you get undefined behavior. So I have a friend who actually tried this when he saw the slide. He said, wow, the compiler will let me do this. <laughs> so the compiler will let you do this, but don't. Uh, Marshall has a talk on how uh, uh, undefined behavior will allow your cat to have puppies. <laughs> so, so try to avoid that. Um, so the other side of it is the constexpert computations. 
Uh, so you can put a const expert declaration on free functions, member functions, and constructors. And the code that's allowed inside of those curlies is constrained, pretty highly constrained in C++11. And in C++14, they relax the rules. And we're going to spend some time looking at what kind of code can you put in there, what kind of code can you not more on what kind of code can you put in. So a const expert constructor allows user-defined literal types. So what's interesting is that compile time evaluation is allowed. We can remove computations from runtime. Why would you want to do that? We'll <coughs> go through this a few times. Um, so you can reduce the runtime execution, you can reduce your total f program footprint, and you can catch errors at compiler length time. Um, I, have, I have some favorite aphorisms that I pull out of programming books, and this is one that I try to live by as much as possible. Um, other people have other favorite aphorisms. This is one of my favorites. So. Okay, backing up, it's allowed to do compile time computations. <coughs> ConstExper can run at both compile time and at runtime. So you write one function and you can use that at compile time. Later on, you can use it in a runtime situation. You don't have to change the code. The same code runs in both situations. The same text. So uh, let's take an example of this. We've got a const expert function that returns half of whatever you happen to pass in. We can evaluate that at compile time. We can tell that it's at compile time because there's a static assert. That will only fire at compile time. We can also evaluate it at runtime and we can use it with information that isn't even available until runtime. Same function. <coughs> so evaluation may be at runtime if you want to force the evaluation during translation. Then you can declare the resulting object, whatever, whatever that function or whatever passes back. If you declare that as const expert, then the compiler is required to eva evaluate that at compile time. If it can't evaluate it at compile time, it will stop dead. Or you can use the result where a literal is required. So, for example, as an array dimension, or for an enum, or something like that. Boris. No. I, so, the, so the statement was, if, at, if the assumption is, if it's possible, it will be done at compile time. And uh, my response was, no. In my experience, uh, it's really the, the, it's, it, the compiler may evaluate it uh, at <coughs> compile time if it chooses to unless you force it using one of these two methods. But is it expected to choose to if it's reasonable? Like if you remove const expert in your uh, Yeah, so if nasty, Yeah what it do? Um, it, You would have to look inside of the generated code to see whether it did it or not. What I the, the way I prefer to look at this is that unless I know that I'm forcing the compiler to do something at compile time, I'm going to assume that it will generate it at runtime. So, and, and we'll, this, this will be a recurring theme that, that if you're expecting something to happen at compile time with const expert, you need to, you need to keep your eye on it because every invocation of a const expr function, its result needs to be declared as const expr or used in a literal, a context where a literal is required. 
Otherwise, the compiler is allowed to evaluate at compile time, but it is certainly not required to. So that makes sense. And I guess you got a glider last time, so you need a top this time. You're going to be busy, John. All right. This is, um, we'll get through about half the slides at this rate. That's OK. So um, constexpr is part of the signature. So you can't declare const5 as a function here and then later implement it saying that it's constexpr. The compiler is, if the compiler sees that, the compiler is supposed to stop you dead in your tracks. So if you declare it as constexpr one place, it needs to be constexpr everywhere. And if you change, if you have different definitions in different translation units, that's a violation of the one definition rule. It's bad stuff. No diagnostic is required. Don't do it. Yes. You mean it's part of the type, not part of the signature. In other words, you can't overload it. That's uh, so. Um, John says that it's part of the type, not part of the signature. You cannot overload on it. Right. Okay. That and sense. yes, that does make sense. And and the uh, and thank you for that correction. Um, you cannot overload on it. Right. And you now need a top. And then you're out of toys. So I'll have to stop giving you toys. All right. Thank you. So I, one of the reasons these toys were, were selected is that they're solid. <coughs> so <clears throat> once you've made this top, it doesn't change much. But you can still do something interesting with it, although I won't on this table because who knows where it will end up. So constexpr code is implicitly inlined. The definition has to be visible in the, in the translation unit before the first invocation of the code. Um, so constexpr works on floating point, which is cool, very cool. Uh, there are a couple of things to watch for. Uh, the constexpr definition, I think, is these, these two rules that I'm going to bring up seem a little odd until you start to consider C++ in a cross-compiled environment. And so if you sit back and say, OK, what's the C++ compiler going to do in a cross-compiled environment, then these rules make perfect sense. Okay? So um, compile time floating point calculations may not have the same results as runtime calculations. Okay? Because if you're on an Intel compiler and you're going to go be running on an ARM, uh, you've got different floating point machinery. So we're allowing for that. Um, the other thing is that you cannot look inside of a floating point implementation. Um, so there are, I, in getting ready for this talk, I was doing a bunch of floating point calculations. And uh, a typical trick is to go you know, produce a float and then dig around inside and look at some of the bits <coughs> and shift them around and get a result. And if you're writing context for code, you can't do that. The reason you can't do that is because the C++ standard doesn't require a particular implementation for a floating point encoding. And it doesn't know that you'll be using the same encoding in your compiler as you will be at your runtime. So you're not allowed to dig around in there. Um, So the question is, if, if the representation is different at compile time versus runtime, how does that get reconciled? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a great question. I'm not a compiler writer. What I would guess is that the thing that gets reconciled is you know, when you're converting your executable from wherever you produced it into wherever the target is, you're going to go through and identify here are the floating point values and convert those to the correct representation for the target. Okay. But that's just a guess. Good guess. Is there the same issue with any of this? 
So the question is, is there an issue with Endianness? And same issue. The same issue with Endianness. <coughs> and, and again, I'm not a compiler guy. What I would suggest is that you, uh, you don't need to worry about Endianness. That's the compiler writer's problem. Okay? So, so if you, it, it with, within blurry degrees, if you have a, let's say, a 64-bit integer that you've computed at compile time, whoever has your tool chain needs to take responsibility for converting that 64-bit integer to the proper representation for a 64-bit integer in your target. That's part of your tool chain because there isn't much you can do about it. Now, if you're doing funny stuff with unions, that may be a different problem because you're doing funny stuff with unions that the compiler can't protect, protect you from. So uh, let's see, and you got a top last time. So I guess you get a glider this time. Could you pass the glider back, please? Thank you. You guys are missing out. Oh, here, all right, yes. So, yeah, so the question is, why doesn't the same apply to integers? And <coughs> I, th d Beeman, do you have an answer for that? I don't have it for floating point numbers, but I do have it for um, if, if the problem is the Indianness, and I suspect the answer is the same in both cases. And that, that, um, you have it for integers, assigned magnitude or one's complement machine, you would have it. Okay, that it's going to give you the wrong answer. With endianness, you can also get the wrong answer on uh, floating points between compilers because of the lack of specialization, the lack of specification for the exact formula. And um, we, in the, and that's why we pulled at the last minute um, the or floating point endianness out of the Indian library because someone generated test, showed test cases where you can in fact force the wrong, you know, the wrong thing to happen yeah. because the compiler is not when this transition is made. Yeah. Uh, doing anything at all, it's just sending the bit rep representation over and it's the wrong answer. Yeah. So I, uh, let me summarize what, what I think Beeman just said. Uh, and then I'll get to, to what Gabby. Um, I believe what Beeman said is that it really is dependent on your tool chain, and your tool, tool chain can screw you up. So check your tool chain. And don't do something that your tool chain won't let you do. So Gabby, you had something to add? So uh, as you correctly pointed out, there is no privacy to try to look at the bytes representation of floating point. So any floating point value you get out of computing through complex function is just as if you wrote that value literally in your source code. And compi it's the compiler's job to know how to <coughs> lay out that in memory for your target. So mm -hmm. you shouldn't worry about it. And the standard doesn't allow you to actually go around and poke. If you try the union trick, it wouldn't work because uh, we also require compilers to track which field you last written to. So if you wrote to the double field and you try <coughs> to bring back to the ins, but you know what? That cannot happen because last time it was double. Yeah. So there are enough safeguards to make sure that uh, these nasty things don't happen. So are there functions that can like say yes? So the question was whether there was an, uh, there is there are functions to get exponent and mantis or sign. Yes, they are but they operate on the compiler's representation and they're sufficiently <coughs> abstract that they will always give you the same uh, answer if you're at runtime. The only uh, problem is that the compiler may have larger <coughs> uh, precision to the computation compile time than the target would, and that is okay, and it's allowed by C99 and got into C++, and, and that's fine. Yeah. Uh, that's a long one. I'm not sure how to summarize it for the microphone. That's okay. 
uh, and I'm going to owe you both a glider and a top later on. But you're way in the back. I won't pass it back that far. Okay, so uh, constex for in C++ 11. <laughs> so if you want to write a C++11 uh, C++ constex for function, it can't be virtual. It returns a literal type or a reference to a literal type, and the parameters must be literal types or references to literal types. The body is one compound statement. <coughs> one statement. Unevaluated sub-expressions in that statement are ignored. That ends up being really important. Just one statement. Okay, yeah, all right. Compound statements are allowed. <coughs> Function calls are allowed. The ternary operator's allowed. We're gonna use... Recursion. <laughs> Thank you. We're gonna use recursion. That wasn't nearly as resounding as I was expecting it to be. Okay, so one, two, three. Recursion. We got it. Nice. So here's, here's a relatively simple example um, of a, a, I'm going to compute the power of a value uh, <coughs> at compile time. And I'm going to allow negative exponents. I'm, I'm not going to, for right now, let's see. Ah, okay, there we go. We're going to use integers for here for the moment. We'll get to doubles there later on. Uh, I'm going to do an, an error check. I'm going to see whether, whether I'm in a range that I think is reasonable. I don't have to do that. The compiler also has its own limits. And if you exceed the compiler's limits, the compiler will yell at you. Um, and then, so that's basically the user facing interface, what the user deals with, before we get to the recursion. And then, here's the recursion. And all we're going to do is we're going to call ourselves until we've called our, until we've multiplied by our value enough times, and then we'll get the power back. So, all looks reasonable? Okay. So there was a throw in that code. That <coughs> uh, doesn't sound like a very compiled time kind of a thing to me. <coughs> What are we doing throwing in a, in a const expert function? So it's an, actually an idiom for a const expert code. <coughs> if there's an error, you go ahead and throw. And it ends up being a, a compile time error. If the code is required to evaluate that throw, a couple slides back it said sub expressions that are not used are ignored. So I can put the throw into my const expert code. As long as, I, as, long as we've, we've got this little C, uh, maybe it's not little, we've got a, a honking big C++ interpreter running down there, figuring out what's going on. As long as it doesn't have to deal with that throw sub-expression, it will merrily ignore it. If it sees it, if it has to go into that sub-expression, the compiler will stop dead. And then, if you're executing this code at runtime, you get a legitimate throw, just like you would expect from regular runtime code. And this is just an example. We've, we've made this function. Let's try it. We're going to compute some values, and we're going to do static asserts. All the static asserts say that you know, we know that we have these values in our hands at compile time. And lo and behold, we can do the same thing at runtime. <clears throat> I don't know what that random value will be until runtime. Um, we can also make const expert uh, constructors in C++11. The parameters have to be a literal or a reference to a literal. No function try block. The body is empty. Uh, basically, there, we'll have a couple of things here. Everything has to get initialized. You can't leave anything uninitialized in a const expert object. The constructor has to take responsibility for everything. Bases, 
all members, all non-static members. And any constructor that happens to get invoked on the way down, that also has to be a const expert. So everything's got to get initialized. And so the way I think about this is that we've got a, a C++ interpreter running. And I don't, I'm not a compiler guy. I don't really know how this works. But I've got a mental model that I've got a C++ interpreter running. And and each of these functions is running its own little C++ interpreter. And you end up thinking, when you write this code, you end up thinking like a functional programmer. I've never actually been, I've only pretended to be a functional programmer, so I can't legitimately say that. But from what I hear, it's kind of like that. Yes? When you say everything must be initialized, does that include plain old data? The, the, does it, it in, data, built in? Data, like in it. Do I have to initialize Yes. That? Yes, any value, any const expr constructor must initialize all non-static members of that object. You really meant it. Yeah, I really meant it. Um, and do you have a slide or a top yet? Uh, no. No? Okay, what do, you, what do you, or a slide? I mean a glider. Thank you. Do you prefer glider. the glider? All right. And yeah, the next question. Yeah, so if you, if you just have the, uh, the brace initializers, that's... Oh, if I use boost value initialize this, this time, boost value initialize... I've never used boost value initialize, so I don't know whether that will work. The question was, can you use boost value initialize? I would guess so, but I don't know that for a fact. Uh, hand in the back. And, oh, let's see, and you get a glider or a top? A glider? Another glider. There's a what about the auto-generated auto constructor? Do they cost extra? Or do you have to explicitly specify your own? So the question is, are automatically generated <coughs> constructors const expert? Um, so I can tell you, I, I, I can tell you in terms of native objects, like ints and doubles and stuff like that. Those are const expert. But if you have like a trivial struct. Uh, oh, okay. And thank you. I, I have the right person in the room. Gabby says, yes, if you have a struct, that's a const expert constructor. So, and, and you get a top or a, oh, glider. a glider. I did bring quite a few, but we might run out at the end. People who want a glider should speak up. So writing a C++11 const expert function, it's highly constrained. Uh, it is surprisingly useful if you, give it, if you put some effort into it. And C++14 is going to make it easier. In C++11, are you allowed to declare a const expert variable in that uh, const expert function? So the question is, are you allowed to declare a const expert variable inside of a const expert function? I didn't try that. Um, Just return state. Same statement. Ah, good point. You can't declare, I mean, yeah. So you, you can't because, okay. yeah. Okay. So thank you, Marshall. Um, glider or top? I'll take it. Away. All right. You earned one on that one. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so let's get into uh, C++14. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no so in C++11, constexer says what you can do, what you're allowed to do. In C++14, there is a laundry list of things that you're not allowed to do with the consequence that anything that's not in that laundry list is okay. It's open season. It's, a, it's an entirely different way of constraining it. And there's, there's a lot of wide open territory. I don't want to walk through the entire laundry list. It's long and I didn't, I didn't actually include all of them here, but I do have two pages of slides 
on constraints that you can't use inside of a const expert function, C++14, including go to, dynamic cast, reinterpret cast, new, delete, and throw, try blocks. Now, what's, so again, just like in C++11, if there's something that, that we're, we're, we're going to conceptualize that C++ interpreter, if there's a chunk of the code in that function that the C++ interpreter doesn't have to deal with, it'll just turn a blind eye and not notice it, okay? So, so you can have a throw in the code, and as long as it doesn't, it doesn't need to evaluate that throw, it'll just kind of ignore it. So, so these things which are not allowed, they're not allowed to be computed at compile time. Oh, okay. <laughs> you need go to for that. You need go to for that. Yeah. So, so as Marshall was saying, you can't do Duff's device in Constexper. So they can do anything else. Yes. So if you do use one of those cannot do things, it will be a compiler error. If you end up evaluating a sub expression using a new or a delete or something. Which is just like the compiler. Yes. So the, the and and for that you get a top or a glider, which you prefer. Glider. The glider. Um, so the the statement was that if you use one of those things that's not allowed, you will get a compilation error. The compiler will stop you dead in your tracks. I love this. You know, this is the time you want to be getting your errors. So yeah, the compiler will not let you write invalid const expert stuff that gets evaluated at compile time. So the rules that we looked at earlier, those are there to protect that, that mythical C++ interpreter. And for the most part, it's like regular code. And it's easier than it was in C++ 11. So that POW function that we'd written earlier, um, using recursion, this is what it looks like in C++14. Same exact functionality, but it looks like normal code. Yes? So if, if you're not sure if your function has one of the not to do things, can you just put const expr on it and see if the compiler yeah. So, yeah, so the question is, if you, if you don't know whether your code follows the rules or not, can you just put const expr on the front, run the compiler over it, and then feel confident that you've done the right thing? And the answer is no. Uh, because until you <coughs> evaluate every part of the expression in a const expr uh, context, thank you, then, then the compiler will let that stuff slide by. Okay, so you can declare that function as const expert. And if you only ever use it in runtime, it is not required to issue any kind of a diagnostic. And you get a glider or a top. Uh, I'll have a, a top. All right. So there's a question over here. You, what happens if I miss the plus plus before the i? <laughs> okay, so the question is, what happens if you miss the plus plus? Will you go into an infinite compilation loop? Um, and, and, and you're in luck. Um, someone, some, I, I gave this talk as a practice talk, and someone else has asked that question before you. So I looked that up in the standard. And there are uh, two, uh, two implementation limits that the standard defines related to this. Um, the first one actually has more to do with C++, const expert and C++11, and that is the suggested minimum recursion depth is 512. Okay? So that's, and, it, and it's, that's just a suggestion from the standard. The compiler is is not required to implement that. They can implement whatever they want. Um, so the other limit that's interesting uh, applies in C++14, which is how many, and I'm not going to get the, I'm, I'm not a standards guy, uh, 
basically how many statements uh, is the C++ interpreter required to be able to interpret on its way to producing a single context per value. And that's somewhat in excess of a million. So there is, a, there is standard guidance for what that mythical C++ interpreter is supposed to be able to do. And it doesn't have to go forever. That, however, <coughs> is entirely up to the implementation. So hypothetically, you know, and I did not try that, you could, you could see whether you can get your compiler to run for a half an hour and then have to kill it. You know, and it, you know, I don't know, and that, but it is, it is up to the compiler. <coughs> Okay, so we're all happy with this. I'm happy with this. I think this is cool. So, and, and I'm just bringing this slide up. It's exactly the same as the previous slide. You use it, what the code we just looked at, you use it in exactly the same way. Um, so, talking about constructors, um, the body has to follow the context for function rules. Every constructor, again, Basically, you can't leave anything uninitialized. That rule didn't change from C++11 to C++14. Initialize everything, all bases, all data members, as long as they're not static members, okay, because they live in a different place. Um, and I thought this was interesting. If you have a non-empty union, it must initialize exactly one non-static data member. So the way I think about this now is that in C++11, you had these little compiler or uh, compilers running in their own little context. In C++14, that context kind of sprawls out. So, so you start here with function A and that context remains as you're digging into other subcalls. And again, this has nothing to do with actual implementation. This is just my own internal model for how's this stuff working. But I get to think like a C++ programmer without new. Yes? So um, you said like a constructor, constants for constructor can take literals as the as the as, Yes. Can take context for constructor objects, like a user different object, like a rectangle taking two points, and points themselves are constructor yes. const context. Yeah, so the question is, can a uh, const expert constructor take other const expert objects as arguments? And the answer is yes. Um, you haven't gotten a toy yet, have you? Do you want it? You have one, okay, okay. I can send you a top. Okay, we'll send a top back. You know, send that back, and then you can ask your question. Uh, so you're comparing. So this is in C plus plus eleven. It was you're a yeah. C plus plus programmer that thinks like a functionalist. Yeah, and that's because you're using recursion. As mm, your, recursion and there's and, still no state. Okay, so so we're gonna if you if you looked at. Let's see if we can. Sorry. Yeah. No, that's fine. Um, it, it. Yeah. Let's let, let's go forward. I think I can. So so Ray was talking about how functional is the C plus plus fourteen stuff, and at least in my experience, it's not very functional at all. It, it, and, and we'll get to some examples where you can look at that. Gabby. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, with the yeah. yeah. <coughs> See if I can get so to it. You can go and mutate a lot of stuff, but when you come back, um, <coughs> the, effect, uh, the side effects are not visible from outside that bubble. Right. 
Right. Uh, so function A can mutate, function C can mutate, but in the end you just get a pure value and all the side effects like you see it. Okay. I'm just delighted that you said that, Gabby, because that's been my model and I, I haven't, you know, I, I, I was, yeah, okay. So, so what Gabby was saying is that once you've, once you've come inside of function A, the data that function A op, you know, builds up, that can get mutated by function B and C and D and all these guys can be mutating their own values. And then once you return the value from function A, this is where the concrete sets. It's no, you know, this is, this is beyond jello. Mm -hmm. So, so you're, you're really not, you know, a functional programmer doesn't get to change anything. Once that value is established, it's stuck. And here, you're really thinking like a C++ programmer. So, when, when, when I started talking to, to my friends and associates about my, my excitement about const expert, I'd, you know, I'd say something like, you know, you can compute a square root at compile time. And they'd say, oh, well, you know, that's cool, but why would I want to do that? <laughs> and so, really, the rest of this talk is why I think there's some real value here. So we're going to look at parsing, we're going to look at floating point computations, and we're going to look at compiled time containers. And we are going to run over. Uh, we won't get to all of this. But let's just charge ahead and get as far as we can. Uh, compiled time parsing. So we're going, to, we're going to build a binary literal in C++ 11, using C++ 11 const expert. And we're going to do this in two parts. First, we're going to get the text <coughs> into the thing that evaluates the binary literal, and then we're going to evaluate that. So in order to get the text in, we've got a, a class that I'm calling const expert text. I can't take responsibility for this. I pulled this off of the CPP reference uh, website, which was very cool to run into. Uh, you'll notice we have a const expert constructor. The way you make a const expert object is not by declaring the class or the struct as const expert. You make it a const expert constructor. So we have a const expert constructor. We're going to pass in a char <coughs> array, and we're going to use the n here. We can use that n to determine the dimension of the array. We have a const expert array operator. So we can go in and look at the values in the array. And we can also remember what the size is. So as a const expert function, we can see how, how many characters were in there. And then we're going to pass one of these guys in, this const expert text. We're going to pass this in to this function, const expert 11 bin. And const expert 11 bin is going to call itself recursively. <coughs> and based on the presence of characters 1, 0, and comma, it's going to compute a value. And if somebody passes us a value that is neither 1, 0, nor comma, we're going to get a compile time error. We're gonna, and we're going to tell them, well, that actually won't come out in the compile time error. But we'll say what's up. So let's go ahead and use this thing. This is what the, what the using looks like. One of the things I liked about this, once you've written this code, you can now go into, or I was using Clang at O3 optimization. If you go look at the generated assembly, these strings are not present. The strings are gone because they're not referred to anymore once we've done the computation. 30 minutes. I'm not going to make it. I'll just charge ahead. Thank you. So all this stuff, all this stuff's happening at compile time. So and in C++11, this is very cool. I wrote. Um, embedded stuff for a long time. 
and I dealt with hardware registers. And it would have been really nice to have been able to write stuff in binary. And you can. So we can do the same thing in C++14. It's way easier to code. And it's not quite as useful because C++14 has built-in binary literals. So you should use those instead. But here's what the code looks like. Um, one of the differences is you can just pass in the, uh, the pointer to the array, to, the, to your char array. <coughs> it, it's just normal C++ code. Why can you pass in the char pointer uh, for C++14 when you couldn't in C++11? Or, uh, what, was the, what was the particular change that allows that? I, I, <coughs> <okay. laughs> it's a good question. Statement. Now you have a oh right. You needed the end for your recursion. Right, I needed the end so so uh, so I knew when it when it was done. So the the question was, what what change allowed me to to pass in the char star? So thank you to both of you. So and it uses we we use it in exactly the same way. So question. <coughs> As so if I had a file with a quote, 001101 quote, I could say paren, return pound include my file, um, and then put the other paren and merrily go on my way. <coughs> and so I could read data from a file, basically, and compile them that way. Uh, using pound include to, to read data from a file at compile time. At compile time. And I haven't tried this. But I think if you gave it the right format, yes. Okay, so, right, right. <coughs> so, so, so far, here, here are some of the questions that, that people have asked me about this stuff is, how do you debug this stuff? What do errors look like to a user, someone who's, who's seeing one of these things? And also, do users want runtime execution? Um, so for the stuff I've done, and again, I haven't done production const expert code. This has all been nights and weekends because we're using Visual Studio. Uh, but, it, but I have done a fair amount of this stuff. So how do you debug this stuff? And there, there are three things. One is that if you think you're not too far off, you can just kind of bull through. Uh, you know, just like any, you know, do, do you bother to pull out the debugger or not? Sometimes you can just kind of squint and say, oh, I think I didn't get this right. Um, but one of the cool things is all of this code runs at runtime. So you can open it up in the debugger. What you have to do is invoke it in a context where it's not required to run at compile time. So I have my const expert function and it returns some value. Have it return that value, but don't call that return value const expert. If you get an int back from the function, just say it returns an int. <coughs> now you can walk into that function using your debugger. Set breakpoint, single step, all you want. That's something you can't do with templates. I'm about to get a disagreement, but. <laughs> but what about auto? When you write auto as a return time, does it deduce the constant expert? No, no. So you have to, if, okay, so the question is, if you write auto on a const expert function, does it deduce the const expert? And the answer is no. You have to say const expert auto whatever. So, yeah. So if you <coughs> initialize a non-literal with the function, then you can run that code in the debugger. Uh, runtime const expert can be pretty darn handy. So it gets tougher if you've written stuff that's complicated enough that you want to debug it with print statements, or if you don't have a very good debugger. Uh, yes? So const expert auto in the function signature, they don't work together, right? You have to have an exact type. You cannot say const expert auto foo and let it deduce the type, the auto type. 
Um, so the, the, the question is, will, if, if you say const expert auto, will that deduce the correct type from the return of the function? And, and I believe that it will. So it's, it's C++. <coughs> so, but to get back to, uh, to debugging, if you want to add print statements, uh, this is harder because the I.O., usually what you want to do is, is I.O. on some part of your const expert function that is actually executing, right? And once it's actually executing, if you have side effects, and I.O. is always a side effect, um, you, 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 can't, you can't include I.O. in something that is going to be const expert. So, <laughs> so anyway, what? <coughs> what I've so I have I have gotten myself into some holes where I've really wanted to use print statements, and in that case, what I've tended to do is I because I've been building test cases. Um, what I'll do is I'll take away the code that's invoking it in a const expert context. So now I'm free to take away the const expert on the declaration. And that opens me up to put any kind of code in there that I want, because it is it's standard C++ code. So I can put that IO, you know, whatever kind of print statements I want in there. And then when it's time to, get ba to, to go back, I put the const expert back in place and then re-invoke my other code. And all of a sudden, I got compile errors everywhere. Okay? But because they're compile errors, I can go clean them up, get rid of all of my I.O. Another thing you can do is, uh, is you can copy the code, because it is in line. You can just take that code, make a copy of it, don't declare a const expert, put all the print statements in you want. But you know, people have asked me, isn't there a simpler way? And, Maybe there is, but I don't know what it is. There's a question there. Is it possible that if the function is running a compile time from the function, function itself, that it will could you Could you repeat the question? Is it possible to detect it from the function itself if it's being run a compile time? So the, ah, okay, excellent question. The, the question is, can the function itself know whether it's being invoked at compile time or at run time? And I don't know of any way to accomplish that. The, com the function itself has no clue, as far as I can tell. Yes? So I've actually forced, so you can take all of your little things and put them in <coughs> detail. And in C++14, you can actually say const expert blah, call your implementation to force it to be const expert, and then just return it. That way, you're always getting a const expert result. So ah. you always want something to be run at compile time, you can just force it by saying, like making a stupid little one line thing and then wrapping everything in detail. Okay, okay. So the the statement was there's a, in C plus plus fourteen there is a, a way to <coughs> by putting all of the implementation in a detail and then having a place where something is, is guaranteed to be returned as const expert, there's a way to force it. And, the, and I'm going to show a different example that is less clever than yours. <laughs> okay. uh, and you get a, a glider or a glider. Did you pass that back? Yes? For the print statement, can you just use a static assert as a poor man's print? <coughs> yes. So without changing anything, you just go a static assert, you know, you expect to better? So yes. Yeah, so the question was, can you use a static assert instead of a print statement? Yeah, then you don't have to, you can That's right. Working. And you can leave the static <coughs> assert in place. So, yeah, so if you don't, if you don't desperately need to have the print, you can, you can put in a static assert. That's another approach. Excellent. And do you get a top or a glider? Uh, okay. A glider? So um, I think getting user errors at compile time is really nice. So what's, what's one of these errors look like? Um, so here <coughs> we're using the same old const expert uh, bin that we had before. And, and I tried using a space <coughs> instead of a comma as a separator. And so the, 
the compiler is going to get mad at me and say, hey, you didn't invoke this correctly. So this is a compile time error. Um, and it, this is out of Clang. So it's saying that that sub-expression is not valid in a constant expression. It has, it's, it's getting unhappy about the throw. So <coughs> that's, that's the kind of error your, uh, your users will be seeing. So if you forget the const expr on this, then what you'll get is a, uh, a runtime error. You'll get a throw just like you'd expect. So you get a runtime error if you forget. And, and you know, so my focus, my personal focus, has been compile time computations. Um, and that's not to say that's the only use for constexpr. I think there's a lot of value in having constexpr supporting both runtime and compile time. Usually what I've been focusing on is what can I do at compile time? And I have to admit, um, I think this is, this is not what I would want my users to be <coughs> dealing with for, for an error for forgetting to call something constexpr when I expected this particular functionality to be used at compile time. So, but that's just speaking for me. So the runtime execution is really handy for debugging. In this particular case, I don't think it's so good for users. Um, there really isn't a lot of, of reason to be doing that conversion from text to binary at runtime. That doesn't seem desirable. And so it, it turns out that the, the easier thing to write is the one that will give you the runtime error. And the more difficult one to write, the one where you remembered the const expert, that's the one that gives you the compile time error. And unlike an issue where you can contain this problem to your function, where you're constraining the function to only run at compile time, <coughs> const expert really isn't designed for that. So every invocation is a potential place for an error to move from <coughs> compile time to runtime. Doesn't matter whether it's C++ 11 or C++ 14. That's just the way it is. every invocation has the potential for the error. So, you know, I like this particular rule, make interfaces easy to use correctly, and I also prefer compile and link time errors. Um, so is there a way to force compile time only? You've got a, a, a mechanism to do it. I don't have that in my slides. I wish I did. Uh, but we'll go through the mechanism that, that I've worked out, which is not as good as yours. <coughs> okay. Yes? Also, can you explain what this mechanism was? Because we didn't catch it. So the, the proposed mechanism was to do your const expert computation, uh, the, the, your, your big heavy computation in, uh, in a detail namespace. And you have an, uh, a function outside of that namespace where the result is declared as const expert, and then you can return that. <coughs> but it only works in C++14 because you're not allowed to use multiple statements. Yeah, and to, to add to that, it's only, it only works in C++14. So my trick, which is not as good as yours, is it to, works C++ it works, it does work in C++11. Um, is to have an, an unresolved external. So we can't get in, it, the, the compiler is really good at not letting you know whether it's compile time or runtime. But we didn't put any rules in about the linker. So we're gonna have an unresolved external. We're gonna declare some sort of character array and we're gonna use that in our throw. And I have 15 minutes, and we'll get as far as we can. So now we're going to get user errors at link time. And that's what the, what the error looks like. So
So the question, the <coughs> why does that work? The throw is not, must not be evaluated at compile time. So we've hopped over that throw every single time. But, but when you include that function at runtime, the function has to include the execution for that throw. So the throw will have an unresolved external. <coughs> so the runtime implementation cannot link. So in C++11, that was the best I could come up with. You've got a better answer for C++14. <coughs> the error's ugly. Uh, doesn't identify the line that caused the error. And it may not work because the compiler is allowed to produce the code. Even though it may not need it, it is allowed to produce the code. In which case, when it produces the code, you will still have that unresolved external, even though you might not have run into it. So this is not a perfect answer. Uh, Richard Smith is the, the C++14 <coughs> guy for Constexpert. So he would know. Alan. Yeah, and and I, I'm I'm you know I I believe it works because he's told me that it works, but I, I haven't tried it myself. So we should let's. Well, okay. Yeah. No, no, I think maybe you can do the same the same kind of trick in C plus eleven if you return if you construct a struct whose only member is the result of your computation and dereference that member of the struct in your return call. So you still get yeah. a single line return. Uh, that yeah. could be. I'll have to constructing the function. Yeah. I <coughs> well, we we will have to play play with that because I don't have slides for it. <coughs> and I you know, I'm not going to pull my compiler out. I know there are people who are courageous enough to do that, but I won't. So, but I will say, at least in terms of the unresolved external, if there is a failure, it will be a false positive. So if the, if the compiler is not clever enough to remove that code, then you'll get the error. At least it will stop you. You will never have a situation where um, the code is being used at runtime uh, with with this technique. Yeah. So this will or will not help you with like you, you want to um, define a, say a static constant double within the scope of a class as as a static constant double number of the class. You, so the question is, can you define a static member of a class as constexper, and do you still have to declare storage for it? Is that correct? Yes. OK. So the answer is, yes, you can declare a, a static constexper member of a class. And, and no, you don't have to declare storage for it. So we can, uh, you, guys, you guys have the, the story on how this works. So um, yeah. <coughs> we'll get a little ways into floating point. I'm afraid we're not even going to get to the containers. Um, so I think the, the parsing is really interesting. Um, so you know, I used it for, for a binary literal. Um, you could also, I mean, the, the the places where you can apply it, well, here you have this idea of including a file and parsing the whole freaking file. Um, you know, I, take, it, take it someplace. <laughs> so I do, I do think that it's worth, when it's appropriate, taking the time to find some way to keep users from getting into a hole. You know, for those functions which should not be called at runtime. Let's look at some, uh, some floating point. 
so constant x per does floating point. Why would you bother doing that? Well, you get your errors caught at compile time. You can reduce your executable footprint. And you can improve your runtime execution. Um, and this is another one of those places where someone said, well, you know, why do I really want to do this? Um, I did embedded stuff for a number of years. And part of what I did was a bunch of stuff with filters. So I'm going to take a biquad, which is a common kind of a recursive filter. And a biquad has basically two components. It has um, its coefficients, which determine the filter response. And the coefficients are usually pretty nasty to compute. <coughs> um, you know, you can't, it's, it's more than just multiplies, adds, and subtracts. But once you've computed those coefficients, as long <laughs> as you're not changing the response of your filter, they stay constant forever. Now, there's a recursive computation in your filter, and that's where you're bringing your data in, you're running it through the filter, and you're producing new values. That's a, typically a runtime kind of a thing. <coughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to look at computing the coefficients for a filter at compile time. So for me, this is a real example. I, you know, if I'd been using C++14 in my embedded environment, I would have wanted to do this. So we're going to make a biquad. We're going to figure out, you know, we're going to have <coughs> different computations based on the response that we want from the, uh, from the filter. These are the coefficients that we have to fill in. We've got five coefficients. And that's just the way biquads work. We've got a <coughs> class that holds the coefficients. <coughs> and because we're expecting to compute the coefficients at compile time, we've got a const expert constructor. And we're going to pass in the type of the filter, the uh, cutoff frequency, the Q of the filter, and the peak gain. <coughs> and we're going to compute the coefficients by calling a function. We've also got uh, a private uh, member function, which we're going to be calling from our friend where the, uh, where the non context for data is sitting, the stuff that's changing. And we've also got some private data. So we know what the type is, and we know what the coefficients are. <coughs> We're going to compute the coefficients in there. You know, there was a function that we call in the constructor. So here's basically the start of that function. And here we've got to compute pow with two floats. We've got to compute tangent. We need to know what pi is. We need the absolute value. You can write all of these functions as const expert functions. And I did because they're not in the standard library. Um, and you can toss in some, some error checking. And then for each of the different cases, for different filter responses, you compute different stuff based on the, uh, the complicated data that you computed earlier. Yes? How is this different from just hard coding magic numbers? Because this is always going to be the same result, right? <laughs> Every time I compile this, I'm going to get the same result. So yeah. how is it different from, from just hard coding magic numbers okay. that are maybe well commented so that... Yeah, and, and that's a great question. So the question is, how is this any different from hard coding magic numbers? And, and I did hard code magic numbers for, uh, for five years. Um, I would... Uh, my... Uh, <coughs> The guy, the guy who knew how to compute the magic numbers, I would, I would send him an email and he'd say, yeah, yeah, we're, we're changing the filter response from this to this. Here are your magic numbers. And we had a list of magic numbers. So, so if you want a, a four kilohertz cutoff, here are your magic numbers. And if you have a three and a half kilohertz cutoff, here are your magic numbers. Uh, for me, I don't like the magic numbers because 
part of the question is, how much do you trust that comment? Uh, and, and, and it becomes, uh, depending on who, who the source is of your magic numbers, it can be an, an issue finding out what the new magic numbers need to be. So I prefer this, but um, absolutely, people who have been doing this for decades using magic don't get numbers. Me wrong. I, I, mm -hmm. I would prefer this as well, but uh, it appears it's a lot more work. That's why I was asking. Well, so some. So if you have an error, you have it once and yeah. you fix it once. Yeah. So, so the, let's see if I can summarize. So if this is part of a library, then you've written, and yeah, and I'm, I'm almost out of time. If this is part of a library, then, uh, then you solve the problem once. And you can, you know, as you get different cutoff frequencies or different responses or whatever else, you can reuse this code. What I found was that I was always going back to this guy, and I don't know what code he had. This code has to exist somewhere. You know, the guy, the guy that I talked to who know all about filter responses, he had this code. I think he had it in MATLAB. <laughs> um, but yeah, he was, he was doing all this stuff. Yes? Why are the math functions not constants? And, uh, and, and, and I'm hoping I can get to that slide. The question is, why are the math functions not constants? <laughs> and do you want a top or a glider? A glider. And I, someone else back here I, I owe a toy to. I think you, you haven't gotten a toy yet, have you? Uh, no. Uh, I'll go for the glider. The glider, yes. OK, let's send that glider back. Thank you. So anyway, we're going to compute these guys. And so in the process, I had to write a bunch of math functions as const expert. Uh, when I first started on this, I wasn't sure I was going to be able to figure it out. But you can figure these out. Um, for POW, I ended up needing to also compute log and x. <coughs> um, and for tangent, I needed to compute sine and cosine because the Taylor expansion for tangent is miserable. <laughs> um, so once you have those coefficients, getting the coefficients is the hard part. This is, this is the stuff that gets computed at runtime. And it's all just add, subtracts, and multiplies. So it can happen really fast. And that's part of the point with, the, uh, with DSP computations. Yes, Boris? Why did you add context to the process? So, yeah, so the question is, why did I include const expert? And, and honestly, I didn't need to, because I'm only going to be invoking that at runtime. So. Yeah, so that's, that's gratuitous. Or maybe it's a habit. It's, yeah, I've been <laughs> typing constexpr for a lot. So Boris, Boris suggests it's a habit. And yeah, that might be true. So um, biquad, which is not the thing which is the coefficients, but, but holds the recursion data, that wraps it. And so we've got, we're gonna, uh, we don't need to look at that slide. Um, so we're going to use it. We're going to make ourselves our const expert coefficients. We're going to compute that at compile time. We're going to put those inside of our recursion values. And now we're going to filter some data. So the benefits of you know, assuming that we don't go with magic values. So the magic value approach, like I said, people have been using that for decades. That's still a legitimate approach. But if we don't go with the magic values, then if you declare biquad coefs as const expert, all that code that I was showing you, including the, you know, compile time computation of tangent and uh, <coughs> POW and all that other stuff. It all comes down to 144 lines of assembly produced by the <coughs> compiler. So I told the compiler, produce this executable, give me the assembly. It was 144 lines. If I forget the const expert, 
then it's 2017 lines. Now, that's not a very fair comparison uh, because in general, most code won't be able to compute <coughs> that much stuff at compile time. So uh, you know, this, is, this is an extreme example, but it's an example. So if you have a constrained platform, you want to make sure that you include that const expert so that you don't end up computing this stuff accidentally at runtime. So I did some timing. You question. Question to the previous slide. So um, is this difference in the, the number of operations or assembly lines? Uh, how, how much it depends on the optimization level? And would it be possible that a clever compiler before introducing context would actually introduce it itself? Uh, so the question is, could a clever compiler <coughs> figure out that it could compute this stuff at compile time, <coughs> even without the const expert keyword? And the answer is probably yes, if the compiler were clever enough. The fact of the matter is there probably weren't any compilers that were that clever. So the, the const, ones? what's that? In the current ones, if you and simply forget the context. So if you simply forget the const, it, it, this was clang, okay? All I did was I left off the const expert. That's the only change that I made. If you remove the const expert, this was clang at 03, high level of optimization. And the question is then to whether or not it's, if you don't have the const expert, is it gonna figure out, hey, I can do this tangent at compile time, and I'm just not convinced that, I mean, yeah. I'm not some compiler guy yeah, so, so the, the answer is it, it might, but, but the only way to force it, the only way you can have personal confidence is to include the const expert. <coughs> so, or to dig through all of the assembly code that's produced by your compiler. I would suggest you include the const expert. Um, Just I'm, as a wild guess, you know, the compiler would have to evaluate every function in the program to see whether it could reasonably yeah. Which, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it's You've just never yeah, right. So 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 Jeff's point is that it, if the compiler were just just hazarding a guess whether something or other might be compilable or might be computable at compile time, it would be evaluating a heck of a lot of stuff. So the 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 const expert keyword is really important in terms of uh, providing that clue. Um, so I am already five minutes over. So people who are hungry should feel free to leave. I am happy to continue as long as you guys want to listen. But we're only a little over halfway through all of the slides. <laughs> so, so we're not going to get to the end. Uh, we could potentially bull through uh, and get to the end of, of uh, the floating point stuff, because we're pretty close to that. So I'll, I'll leave it to your discretion. And, and for those of you who are leaving, thank you very much for your attendance. So there's a question in the back.